Um, but we're doing this so that when we start throwing things like RTC peer connection, some of you who don't know what that is might actually know what we're um, talking about in this context. Um, so as Amit mentioned before, um, the code is on some thumb drives that's going around, but there is a GitHub repo here. Um, Joy 8-bit WebRTC workshop. Um, it consists of three folders. One's the slides, which is this, so you can follow along, go ahead, go back, um, anything you like. There's demos, which is going to contain all the demos for the particular slide deck. Um, and then there's the code, which is the client and server implementation that we're going to implement at the end. <clears throat> so why don't we start? Um, first of all, yeah, we can talk about WebRTC. Um, WebRTC is awesome if you've never used it. In fact, you, if you use Google Hangouts, you've probably used it in the last few months in that they've silently been trying to trial using WebRTC um, as part of a, as a sort of, as a um, grace, as an improvement to the otherwise horrible Flash implementation. Um, so I'm Joe Peterson, um, as you probably know already. That's me on Twitter. Please follow me on Twitter because my life value is dependent on how many people follow me on Twitter. Um, and that's me on GitHub as well. Um, I work at McKinsey and Company. Uh, like well, apparently, like half of the people here at this point. It's like there seems to be 20 or 30 people who work at McKinsey. Um, we're awesome. Um, if, I did, if we say so ourselves. Um, but essentially, the reason I want to talk about WebRTC is, it's, as I said, it's a very cool technology, and what it gives you is something that we haven't had on the web for a very long time, which is a native way of doing video and audio conferencing, a video audio peer-to-peer -peer communication. And the fantastic thing, we're going to talk about the data channel as well, which is also awesome. Well, let me just turn my phone off to make sure I don't get any text messages. Um, what it also gives us is this data connection, and it's something that is incredibly important to the future of the web. Um, Brendan Ike, the guy that created JavaScript, um, kind of this great quote, which is, WebRTC is the front in the, in the long war for an open and unencumbered web. And there's a very good reason why that is. Um, mainly because, as we all know, the, the web, as it is at the moment, is a federated network. You have servers that communicate with clients. That was originally how it was designed. It was a document repository originally, right? It was um, HTML was a document markup language with Albany apps with it, which is sort of probably not the point of it. But essentially what WebRTC gives us for the first time is a way of decentralizing the, decentralizing the web, of allowing us to connect peer-to-peer -peer in a way that we've never been able to do before, or never been able to do before easily and natively in the browser. Um, so as I said, it's very decentralized, which is fantastic. Um, which means that there's no single point of failure. It means that network conditions are less of a problem or somewhat less of a problem. Um, it has better privacy. Um, why is that? Um, we've all heard about the um, NSA spying allegations recently. Um, a lot of that is because it's very easy for state level actors to inhibit people's privacy, right? If they just, if on the, the international cables that sit between the Gmail servers and you, if they just tap those cables, they've got everyone's Gmail, right? But if we're doing peer-to-peer -peer networking, that becomes a lot more difficult to do. There isn't a single point of failure that we have to worry about in terms of being compromised. It also means that it's, the third point here is that there's security by default. And what does that mean? One of the biggest mistakes we ever made on the web, um, and that everyone recognizes, is that we allowed plain text HTTP. Having encryption by default not happen with HTTP was a huge mistake, and it's led to massive numbers of problems. And it would solve a huge amount of the security and malware issues that we have in the world if HTTPS was ubiquitous and happened everywhere for everything. And the great thing about WebRTC is that it's on by default. They didn't make that mistake again. In that WebRTC connections are encrypted by default, which is fantastic. So it means that you have a greater level of privacy and security for what are going to be very private conversations. If you're talking to your parents or your wife, you don't want anyone looking into it, or if you're doing anything via um, WebSockets data channels. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a high-level look at what the APIs are. There are essentially three APIs, I'm, two top-level APIs I'm going to talk about. Um, and we're going to look at some examples for each of them, how they're implemented, some, some libraries and some frameworks that you can use to make it easier to implement these things. But actually, when you're working with the raw APIs, they're not actually terribly difficult to work with, as you'll see, hopefully. Um, oh, there we go. Um, so the three APIs we're going to talk about are Get User Media, uh, which you may or may not have come across before, which is about of, um, uh, grabbing device media from a user, video, audio, um, and they're actually talking about using some other things like, tact uh, like tactile inputs in the future, but at the moment it's just uh, video and audio. 
We're going to look at RTC peer connection, which is the networking layer for doing peer-to-peer -peer connections in the browser. And then we're finally going to look at data channels specifically, because I think they're incredibly cool. Um, and it's something that will tie them all together at the end for the code we write. Um, so first we're going to talk about media stream. Media stream is awesome. Um, essentially, what it does is it allows you to represent a stream of binary data from some sort of user input, be it uh, uh, a camera, a webcam, be it an audio, microphone, pretty much anything you like. And the great thing is, is that these are streamable um, these are streamable binary arrays. So it allows you to essentially push the flow of this binary data wherever you'd like it. In our context, we're going to push it out across a WebRTC connection. But theoretically, I'll show you a demo in a moment. Um, you can do pretty much you can do some really cool things as well. Some of them are a bit trivial, and I'll show you in a minute. It's just a, I think it's a very cool demo, but we'll see. Um, but essentially, this is the, the core part of what MediaStream represents, in that it's essentially a video track, which is a single instance of a video track that represents a stream. And then we have uh, audio media stream that contains a left and a right channel. So it's natively stereo as well, which is awesome. Um, it's not just a mono output, which is one of the problems that Flash had for a very long time um, with the fallbacks for this stuff. Um, so essentially, this is the API. That's all it is in order to get a video. Um, and even here, this probably could actually be a little, I've got an on error callback, doesn't actually do anything here. But as you can see here, this navigator get user media, this is a bit of an issue because get user media, all a lot of this stuff is hidden behind browser prefixes. So WebKit, uh, get user media, Moz, get user media. It's a bit of a pain. So we're just assuming here that we've normalized these into a single navigator get user media. I mean, it's a single line. I can show you in a minute in some code. Um, but essentially, all we need is to pass three arguments to our get user media. Constraints up at the top here, which is this object, is something I'm going to talk about in a couple slides time. So I won't go into too much detail about it here. But essentially, success callback is essentially we just have a query selector that grabs an HTML5 video element. When we set the source with a URL create object URL, and now this is a fantastic little um, uh, method, a uh, uh, fantastic method on the URL object. Essentially, it allows oh. us to represent binary blobs as the source for a particular element. In this context, you can do it with image elements, anything that has a source, effectively. So, uh, uh, sorry to disturb. Can you increase the font? Sorry, increase the size of the. Ah, of course. Is that better? Oh, doesn't need to be. Weird, it doesn't need to be increasing properly. How's that? Is that better? It's a little difficult to increase because reveal doesn't necessarily zoom in the way you'd envision it would. Um, but yeah, what I can do is I can, when we actually go into some code, I can blow it up a little bit more. This is just to sort of demonstrate how it works. I could talk in a little bit more detail um, when we have bigger text that we can all see. Um, so essentially, yeah, it's, it takes three, um, it takes three arguments. Success callback, self-evidently, is a callback that's called on success, and error callback self-evidently being the error callback. And what's great is as you, if you ever use this API in the browser, you understand when you get the nag bar at the top of the screen that says um, this, this uh, particular domain would like to access audio and video, and you can click allow or deny. And obviously the error callback being the thing that's called if they click deny. So you can show up a message that says like, please reload the page and let me have your video. Um, which is also one of the great reasons it's great for privacy, because previous flash exploits have allowed you to turn on people's cameras without them actually having given you explicit consent to do so. So it's awesome that it's not actually possible to turn on a webcam with this API without the user giving you explicit permission to do so, which is awesome. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the first of the demos we've got going. Um, and this is, again, this is a bit of a trivial demo um, at the moment. But what it does is it really gives you, that shows you the power that you can do with, um, essentially what we're doing is we're face tracking um, this particular element on the page. You can see this is just a get mit this is just a video element and I've got user media and I'm projecting it into this box. And we've just got a bit of software that's tracking my head, as you can see with the green box, that allows me to go back and forth and to sort of give me some perspective on this. Again it's quite trivial, but it's a good it's a good idea of some of the stuff you could possibly do with games. It's super useful. I've seen games that are like sort of we like we fit kind of things where you have to jump up and down in order to get points. Um, they're really awesome. But so this just gives you a really great idea. I can actually show you what a blob URL also looks like while I'm here. Um, there we go. That's what a blob URL looks like. Um, essentially, you don't ever have to worry about that because the APIs take care of that when you do an object URL. But what it essentially gives you is this, which is this blob prefix here, which allows, which represents a stream, uh, is streaming data to this particular object. Okay, so that's that one done. Again, the demos will get better and more useful. This one was just a cool one, I thought, that would allow us to demonstrate it without just showing video of my face. Um, again, these are a couple more ones. Again, forgive me. Um, 
but this is actually I, this is so cool. I have to show people this every time I do it. Um, takes a while to load because the Wi-Fi is a bit slow. I'll come back to it. Um, and the other one's webcam toy, which is also awesome. Now we'll talk about constraints for a little while, that object I talked about at the beginning. And constraints are the thing that allows you to specify what kind of media you want from a page. Um, in this context, we're having video, and we have a mandatory object within it. And what that means is that the video that I want to receive from the user is video of these proportions. In this context, it's 720p, but it can be anything. And it also allows you to pass an array, so you can give the user an option to say, I want uh, VGA, QVGA, HD, or any, even big, I mean, I've seen people do 1080p. Not everyone's uh, webcam support that, but that's why you have fallbacks in there, which is awesome. So I'm going to quick, actually, ah, ASCII loaded. Let me just show you this. I think this is so cool. It does a real-time visualization of my face in ASCII art, which is really cool. Um, again, pretty trivial, but it shows you some of the power that you can get with these stream objects that you get back from media. You could do, um, a lot of this is done with Canvas and Request Animation Frame. Um, and like yesterday in the talk, uh, the request, anima request animation frame at 60 frames a second is a really fantastic way of doing animation loops in the same way that you do with games, like um, Capital talked about yesterday. What I'm going to do here is quickly give you a demo. I'm going to go through some code on this one, because it will just show you how easy this stuff is to implement. Um, essentially, what we have here is just a quick demo that allows you to give vi different video sizes based on uh, the constraints object that you pass into the configuration. So here we have QVGA, it's really tiny, but obviously it allows you to stream with much less lag and much less jitter because you're passing much less video data across the wire. Uh, we can pass VGA, um, which is requisitely bigger, as you'll see in a moment. There we go, it's even bigger. And finally we have HD. And obviously HD is great, it's super great clarity, but remember you're passing all of this data down the wire. So it becomes, oh, it's a bit bigger than my screen even. Um, you're pushing this all down the wire, so you have to think about network connectivity. One of the great things about these peer-to-peer -peer connections is that you reduce latency massively because you no longer have a server in between you and the other person. So the, the requisite times and latencies are going to be reduced accordingly, right? But we still also have to think about the fact that people have crappy internet, which is unfortunate, but we do. Um, but what I'll quickly do is I'll quickly show you the code. Um, that we do in order to make this constraints work. And it's super simple. I mean, it's like 70 lines, and it would probably be 30 if we didn't have various different options. Can everyone see that? A bit bigger? How's that? Good? <laughs> so essentially what we have here is we just have some basic JavaScript um, where we grab some selectors, and then what... Sure. Uh, no, WebRTC is available in Firefox as well. And IE is a big issue. Um, IE support in IE 11, I believe, is coming. I believe it is. Yeah, they said it's coming. I'm not. It's not currently in place, but they do have plans to implement it. There are some things that I can mention at the end. Specifically, if you remind me, um, there are some libraries that do flash fallbacks essentially. But the problem there is that you have to have a server intermediary in order to do flash fallbacks. Yeah, indeed. So it gets a little complicated and it gets a lot more complex if you need to support IE. But there are definitely ways of doing it. But again, this is still quite an experimental API. So it's something that I would use in production, but under very limited circumstances. Just because, obviously, as you said, um, it doesn't have rec the ubiquitous browser support like we'd expect or that we'd need to support a production application. But there is definitely stuff you could do. Um, and it just gracefully degrades into Flash. Um, so essentially what we have here, as you can see, is that we're passing this video object in the same way that we had in the slides with max width and max height. Um, it essentially allows us to pass different objects, uh, QVGA, and we just, we're just binding some events. Um, that essentially, so when you click one of these buttons, do get user media again, but with a different set of constraints, so you can show a different video. Um, essentially, this is all we need right here, and this is just a bit of logic to stop it if we've got a previous um, stream running. So you can stop previous stream and start the new one in the same video element. But this is all we need. So we have success callback that I can show you here, which is the same as the code that we had before, um, which is just this. We've got window.stream, so we're writing the stream onto the window object so that it's accessible. This, obviously if Doug was here, he'd tell us how bad this is, of writing into the window object. 
Um, but it's a really common pattern. You see, it's not it's not necessary at all. But when you see people implement these things, you're passing streams around a lot. I mean, a lot of contexts you have, for instance, this success callback. If you had a complicated view object, um, you're going to want to pass that stream representation around to different methods in your particular prototype, for instance. And therefore, what a way that a lot of people do that is they just um, hoist it into a higher scope and just pass it around that way. Um, but again, one of the problems you see is you also see a lot of people doing this. So again, we need to like remind them to read the good parts again and to lint everything they possibly can. But I'm just doing it for convenience sake here, because everything else is a window object as well. And hopefully, Doug isn't here to judge me. Um, so as I said, this is very simple. And we're just adding in some dimensions. Because what you can do is when you get video, is this video object here, um, what I can do is I can just do console.log uh, video. And what I can show you guys is you get lots of metadata back about the particular video objects. Um, and what, one of the things that's going to be um, really key for doing this whole presentation is the, the data that we get back from these objects is massive and the metadata. Um, so we've got the video element here, and it has all kinds of uh, 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 methods attached to it as a DOM element, so for doing all kinds of stuff about getting streams, setting streams. So it's something I'd really encourage you to check out, but that's more to do with the video element itself than it is to do with uh, uh, get user media. Um, so yeah, that's that. So that's constraints. Again, we'll come back to this as well because as you can imagine, there's a video here, there's also an audio constraint um, for getting microphone data. Um, but again, it works in exactly the same way. Um, it's just we're going to talk about audio a little separately. Um, right now, in actual fact. So web audio, in this context, what we're doing here is we're actually using the web, audio, the web audio API for playing audio. Another way you can do it is the same way that we did with video, in that it allows you to add it to just an, uh, an audio element, HTML, um, or a video element even. You can just set an audio track on a video element. But in this context, we're just using the web audio API, so we can play it directly without having to interact with the DOM at all. Um, again, this is a bit of a separate API that we could probably spend hours talking about, so I won't go into too much detail. But essentially, you can see that the way of getting it is this WebKit get user media is exactly the same as it was before. Is it, but we haven't passed the third callback there because I forgot it. Um, but as you can see, this it's just audio equals true. And in constraints that we've talked about, if you don't want to pass this mandatory um, hash, you can't just pass true, and it will give you the browser defaults. So where you do it in to get audio and video for a particular context is if you want to just default, you can just do true, audio, true. And one of the great things about video, the video constraints is that you can pass it frame rate and all kinds of other things that make it a very powerful API for getting video and for getting different types of video. Um, so yeah, that, this, that's where we'll do. I've got a little demo here as well that gives you a really quick example of how we actually go about doing audio. As we can see here, we just have a spectrum analyzer that's grabbing my voice from my laptop. You can see all it's doing is it's rendering out uh, the gain channels onto a canvas. And I can show you how we do this in a second. Um, I could talk for quite a long time about how we render this onto a canvas, but it's probably not going to be particularly relevant um, uh, to this workshop. But one of the great things is that as you'll see when I show you the code for this in a moment, it's like four lines of code to get microphone input, which is awesome, right? I mean, if you've ever had to get audio or video input from Flash, it's the most painful, mind-numbing experience you can think of. There's like having to use the ActionScript API, and yeah, it just takes a very long time, and it's painful, which is awesome because this isn't. Um, so if we come back in here, uh, we close close, we go audio main. As we can see here, a lot of this draw stuff is just about drawing it to a canvas, so there's not a massive amount that we need to cover here. Um, but as we can see, um, pardon me, um, right down at the bottom, we have this same thing that we had in the previous one, in that we have a setting audio true in exactly the same way that we could have set video true and got defaults. And there are other options that you can pass into audio in the same way you could pass into video. But a lot of the time, it's not quite as important as giving different video resolutions, right? Because there's all kinds of ways of doing, like, if um, if you can somehow detect the 3G connection, for instance, say, for instance, you're building a Cordova app. And actually, this isn't actually supported on iOS at the moment, WebSockets, but it's supported on uh, Chrome for Android. Um, it essentially allows you to say, all right, if you've got 3G, get me a tiny video, and I'll send tiny video. If you've got Wi-Fi, give me a big video. That's going to look really awesome. Um, but audio is pretty much the same. It's very easily compressed, and it compresses very well audio. So you don't really have to worry about it, but you can get bit rate. So I could say I want only um, uh, uh, 20 hertz bit rate as opposed to a full 44 stereo bit rate. Um, but essentially, all we're doing here is we're just using the, as you can see, that 
get use a media API that I talked about being really different is this stuff here. It's all of this horrible code. Um, and a lot of it is literally all we're doing is that when we've created this um, audio context, and the audio context in the web API exposes lots of primitives for getting all kinds of really deep audio data like gains, spectrum analysis, all kinds of It's not really too relevant to what we're talking about here, but if you, the, this is included in the repo, so feel free to pull this apart if you've got any questions, like grab me on Twitter or email me and I'm happy to answer any questions about the stuff that we're not covering here. Um, but long story short is that we allow it to sp we split our audio into channels. So again, the actual relevant thing for the WebRTC is probably three lines. The rest of this is just using the Web Audio API, which is also awesome, which you should check out. Um, so finally is another quick thing. I'm not, there's no demo or anything, but there's also screen capture. This is a new thing within Chrome. It essentially allows you to say, I don't actually care, I don't actually want the webcam input from a user, I want a screen input. It essentially allows you to capture the entire screen and send that as a stream, which is awesome, as you'd imagine, right? It's going to mean like that's, that horrible experience of doing screen, sc screen shares and things like Skype becomes dead, and I no longer have to curse Skype every every time I open the application. But again, it's hidden at the moment. You can only do it over HTTPS. It's a bit finickety to get working. Um, but I definitely encourage you to check this out. Um, so the next API is peer connection. This is the important one. This is the one that actually is the um, network layer for WebRTC, or what we think of as WebRTC. And as you'd imagine, the, the two of them are, go hand in hand. When we think of WebRTC, we think of video. And these two things in combination are essentially what make up that concept. Um, and it, it's very complex. Um, I'll show you a diagram in a minute for what the stack looks like for processing these things, but it does a massive amount of stuff. Um, signal processing, it does codec negotiation, so it's like, okay, you support Opus, I support something else. Um, we both have a core, and we both have a shared codec we support, so let's use that shared codec. Um, it handles all the peer-to-peer -peer stuff, so it does like packet loss. It's just a massive stack. And this was probably the biggest part of implementing it in the browser because there's so much here. It also does the security, like I mentioned, it does the encryption on everything that goes back and forth, and it does bandwidth management, which is also awesome. And, but again, if you look at this, this is just a simplified, apparently. I got some HTML5 rocks, and this is what they call a simplified representation of what this stack looks like. Um, so you can imagine what it would look like if it wasn't simplified, right? Um, but I'm not going to go through this because, frankly, we probably all fall asleep from boredom. Um, but essentially, what's nice is it's a complex API, but actually implementing it is super easy. It's literally just in these 10 lines of code. And actually, I've just realized I've forgotten to implement the get answer callback. So forgive me, but I'll show you in a moment when I show you the code that where it actually runs. Essentially, it's just creating a new RTC peer connection, adding an on add stream, which essentially says that this is a callback that executes when I've got a stream coming in through my connection. And essentially, the other concept is this concept of offers. And what these offers are, are ways of the browser declaring what it's capable of doing, or what the implementer of the code that uses it wants it to do. So essentially, that's things like, um, essentially says, okay, I can offer you video and audio, and then the implementer can then get the offer, um, set a remote offer, and you can have a thing that says, okay, they say video and audio, but I actually only want video, or I actually only want audio. Um, so it's essentially just a descriptive protocol for describing these streams of data that go back and forth. And actually, no, I'll show you the demo first of all, and I can actually show you the code working. Um, so again, this is a super, super simple demo. So like, it's, we start, what we do is, essentially, there's my face again, and I'm sure you're going to get tired of seeing my face by the end of this. Uh, and so essentially what we do is we call the same browser window. And in that what we're doing is that we're not going out onto the network, but we're utilizing the browser API to set up a local peer connection. Um, and one of the really interesting things is you can also do this between tabs. Um, there is cross-tab communication in HTML5 in the new version of it, but this is actually a really neat way of doing it if you don't want to use that API, which isn't terribly well supported at the moment. And so as you can see, there's two videos of me. Um, and what I'll do is actually show you the code for this stuff, because it's really interesting. Um, so essentially we have this code here, I mean, as you can see, look, I mean, it's 122 lines, about which 50 could probably disappear, they're only there for the demo, to implement video chat. I mean, that's awesome, right? I mean, how many times, if, as I said, if you ever had to implement Flash video chat, this, is, would, this would barely even load an SWF file at this point, I think. Um, so as you can see here, um, there are a couple things I'm going to talk about in more detail um, in the future. Um, but up to now, do you have, does anyone have any questions or have any queries or anything about what we've covered already? Because um, I just want to make sure that I'm not skipping too far ahead and anyone has any questions. No? Sweet. Again, put your hand up if you do have any questions. Sure. 
Yeah. Is P2P model still the way to go, or Skype is teaching? I completely recognize it. Uh, Skype actually has a very unique set of problems. In the, um, A, they are a single operator working at massive scale. Two is that they've implemented their own protocols or proprietary protocols. So it's, a, it's as much an issue of scaling those protocols as it is anything else. Whereas the nice thing is, is that there is an underlying technical bed that this stuff relies on, which is the browser which are these really well-implemented, well-battle-tested platforms for implementing communications, which Skype didn't have. They had to roll it themselves. So you're right in that there are a completely different set of challenges doing peer-to-peer -peer communication versus doing a federated communication like the web. But you're working on a bedrock that is technically much more sound. And again, it's an open standard, right? It's anyone can contribute to, anyone can improve. Um, I mean, I put it this way, I mean, if Skype was based on WebRTC, their platform would probably be a lot better. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm a, not a huge fan of the Skype product. Um, sure? <laughs> Hello. So, I'm less uh, looking for ways to know record of, apart from the peer-to-peer -peer connection. Uh, let's say I want to record the video as well. Yep. So, using that Get Media API, I can get the frames. Yep. So can I use it to know use the file API kind of stuff and then sync the data? Absolutely. Um, one of the interesting things you can do is that I actually did it for the uh, one of the videos, but I removed it because it's probably a bit complicated, is that what you could do, instead of streaming the data to a video object, you can stream it to Canvas. And what that then allows you to do is to extract that data into a blob format that's writable to disk. So in the same way you can like save images from a Canvas, you can record stream output from a canvas as well. So it essentially allows you to stream it into a canvas, and you take what's in the canvas, and it gives you something that the file API can save to disk. Um, one thing that I would suggest, though, is web workers will be a huge friend of yours, because what you're going to end up doing is that it's computationally very expensive to do. So one of the things that um, I think we can talk afterwards, I can actually, I, it's not on GitHub yet, but um, if you ping me on Twitter, I can send you the link because of the code I've written. Essentially, what you do is you kick off a web worker that does all of your video outputting and saving so that your main uh, runtime thread or your main browser, your paint thread doesn't slow to an absolute crawl. But yes, it's very possible. Very possible. Thanks. Um, so yeah, um, what we're going to do here is that, um, pardon me, um, what we can do is we, if we have our start by, let me just grab the start method. Uh, da, da, there we go. So essentially what we're doing is first of all is we're grabbing our media API as you'd imagine in the same way we did before. And what we're then doing is, well, this is going to be one of those times where I forget to type and it's going to be very embarrassing in front of lots of people. So again, that's what we're doing here is we're just setting a stream so that we view our video as we did in the previous two or three examples. And then obviously then we have the way of clicking the call button that sends it and that starts the RTC peer connection um, to the other browser. So what we can then do is look at the call method in here. Um, and essentially what we have is, again, what we just do is just um, give you some device information so you can actually see what's happening on the console. And then we have an implementation here, which is we start a WebRTC peer connection and we pass servers to it. Servers, I'm going to talk about, uh, we have a section on this a little later on, um, which is going to be about ice and stun and turn, which are one of the most annoying parts about WebRTC, but I'm trying to get all the good stuff out of the way first, so you don't like want to leave right away. So essentially what we're doing is that we're just setting up two connections, and this is a bit arbitrary in that we're doing it in the same context. So we're setting up both a local and a remote um, uh, peer connection at the same time, and we're sort of subscribing them to each other. Um, so it means you can get local video between the two. Um, but as you can see here, that get, get on that stream, it's got remote stream, and um, we, so we, we're saying there's the offer that's going to pass, saying this is what I can do, send, I'll send you the offer, and then you process the offer. Based on that, you start a stream and stream it out to a video. Um, so again, a, lo a lot of this is just, there's just wrapper code around that previous very short, very concise example from the slide. Um, but as we can see that there's a, I mean, it's a very simple process. I mean, as I said, like there's probably 80 lines of relevant code here, as opposed to probably 120 of me faffing about for too much. Um, so again, it's very simple, and these things are really cool. So like, as I said, check out the demo. If you've got the demo now, feel free to open it, have a look through it. Um, if you have any questions later on, as I said, throw your hand up, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. But as you'll notice, one of the things that will, that will be ubiquitous across all of these examples and all of these codes, all of this code is the annoyance that you have to go through in order to get 
non-browser prefix versions of APIs because all of this is unfortunately still hidden behind browser APIs. Do you have a question? Um, it doesn't natively, no. Uh, the native APIs um, don't have a sort of a bootstrap class that allows you to very quickly do things, but that's one of the nice things about the frameworks we're going to talk about a little later on, and they make it crazy simple. You just give it like a DOM ID for where you want the, your video, and a DOM ID where you want other people's videos, and that's it, and it just does it all for you. Because, I mean, it is fairly boilerplate, right? I mean, a lot of this is, like, get an offer, send an offer, stream it to a video, so y you're going to want to and you don't pay any penalties for using frameworks. Like obviously, if you use, if you're directly manipulating the DOM versus using jQuery, you could pay a performance penalty for it. But the nice thing is with this stuff is that it's negligible or non-existent the performance penalty you pay. So I, I would always do it. I mean, <laughs> actually, that's a very good question because for our uh, the code we're going to write in a little while, I actually rolled my own WebRTC implementation. Um, and it was about 1,500 lines of JavaScript in total. And I realized that if I were going to go through it and we were going to talk about it, we'd probably be here till 2 AM, because it's a very complex set of fallbacks and edge, and edge cases that you need to take into account. But there are lots of existing ones that are awesome um, that I'd definitely check out. Is there another question? Ah, sweet. Um, so yeah, check this out. Um, if you've cloned it from GitHub, um, put your hand up and let me know if you've got a question. Um, but I want to move on quickly, because I've got some side, quite a few side I want to get to. And um, finally, RTC data channel. This is one of the things that I actually think is better than this. I mean, audio and video is great, but we've been able to do audio and video in the browser for a very long time. I mean, it's been hunky and a bit crappy with Flash. But what we can do is RTC data channel, something we've never really been able to do before, which is essentially do peer-to-peer -peer arbitrary data communication. I can send you a file. We can do chat. We can do very private chat because it's an encrypted data channel specifically between two people. So you see all of those apps that have been released for mobile devices at the moment that do secure chat that allow you to say I can send encrypted messages to my friends. What the good news is is that this already exists in the browser and you can implement it yourself in probably 20 lines of code. Um, and I put this slide in this morning because yesterday in the talk on HTML5 game program, someone asked the question of what's a good way of doing networked gaming with PhaserJS? Um, so you can say you can have, if you have some state you need to share across the network, RTC data channels are perfect for this. That you cannot get a low, you probably can't get a lower latency connection between two different peers. And the great thing is, is that you can do mesh networks, right? So you can have 50 people connected with 50 concurrent connections, sharing data between them. Um, so essentially, it gives you a way of. I just can't with a really arbitrary example here. Like you can pass some like arbitrary data as an object to send data and just pass it to another client. And the great thing I also found out as an example is that. Probably not relevant here, but if you were here yesterday, PhaserJS has a two JSON serialization method for its game objects. So you can do this in about 10 lines of code in your Phaser game. But um, that's harking back to yesterday. Um, to cap his, to his, awesome, his awesome talk. Um, as I said, there's some interesting things here. It's the same API as WebSockets. If you've used WebSockets, you know exactly how this works. Um, it's ultra low latency, as I mentioned, because there's, no network, there's minimal network hops. There's no servers in between for exchanging data. And this is a really interesting one, in that there's essentially a it's the worst named API I've ever come across, because I don't know why you choose an API that says, oh, I, I want to use the unreliable API. I want to use like the crappy API, thank you very much. But essentially the difference is, is that one is based on UDP and one is TCP. Obviously UDP is fire and forget, so it's much faster, it's, but then again you don't have any act responses, so you can't know whether the client's actually got them while they've lost in transit, or they've just disappeared up into the ether somewhere. Um, but obviously, most people use reliable, but UDP is perfectly good. It works fine. In my demos, I'm mostly using it, uh, mainly so we don't hog as much bandwidth. Um, and this is an implementation. Again, all of these APIs look very similar, right? I mean, you create, you create an object from, a, from, you create a new instance of, an ob, uh, of a window object, um, and then you add some event listeners to it. In this context, um, this RTP data channel here is not necessary anymore, um, unless you want to support old Firefox. Um, at the moment, you don't have to pass it. Um, so RTC on data channel, essentially it says that uh, when we get a data channel, um, add an event listener. So we then create an event channel, and then we say when we receive a message, do something with it. And that message in this context is just a string, but it can be a JSON object, it can be a binary blob, it can be a stream, it can be pretty much anything you like. Um, and in this context, what we're doing is we're just putting it into 
uh, a div so we can see it. And then for that to receive messages is just this, right? Which is crazy simple, mate. That's simpler than the XML and HTTP API. I think we can all agree, right? Like, so we've got 50 lines to like actually across browser open up a, um, an AJAX request. And the second one here, if we've created our new PC object, and what we've done is that we've actually just created a data channel, a new data channel, which we've been reliable false, so we're using UDP. And then we're essentially saying, so when you click this button, get the data from this text, and then we just have a send method. And that's literally all you have. And the other person will receive it on their on message handler when they've started it up. So again, crazy simple, um, like, and it's so, so easy to implement and so reliable. Um, let me show you a demo here that we have. Um, again, this is a bit of an arbitrary demo. So we we click start. We've established the two connect the bidirectional connections between each other. Um, what I then what I can then do is I can say hello, and it receives hello. Um, and again, again, this is a little arbitrary because I'm doing it in the same browser window. But what I'll do is I'll just quickly show you the code. Uh, data channels main. And again, this is this code is like tiny, and a lot of this is um, just like. DOM manipulation stuff and some fallbacks. But essentially what we have here is we have a create connection. As again, all of this should be fairly self-explanatory um, if you want to run through this while I'm talking. Um, is that we have this thing, Web WebKit RTC peer connection. I didn't actually need to pass that because I'm using the WebKit one, but anyway. Um, and what it does is it tries to create a send channel between the two. So what we're doing a try there, obviously, in case there's been some sort of like network interruption or if it's dropped or I haven't got some kind of connection. Um, Essentially, what it does is it just creates a send channel, right? It just says create a connection, create a send channel that I can then send some arbitrary data along. In this context, what I'm doing is I'm grabbing it out of the DOM from um, a text box, and then I'm sending it across the wire on a button click. It's very simple indeed. Um, and what you can do is that what we're also doing is we're doing some ch state change, obviously. Um, so what we want to do is that we want to, in my context, I'm showing and hiding, I'm adding disabled the buttons and stuff in this context, but obviously when you're implementing it, pardon me, you do something a lot more sophisticated, like you show a connected message, or you show an icon that says connected to user, or something, you know what I mean? But in this context, what I'm doing is I'm just showing and hiding buttons. Um, so here we have, we have the local peer connection and the remote peer connection with the same sort of methodology that we did when we did shared video. So we just have a local and a remote in the same bit of code that says, I'm available, and then subsequently says, I'm available too, let's chat. Um, Again, we just have some DOM stuff here, and we're just adding things into the DOM. So we've got this send channel send, as we showed before. So we're just getting the value from the data channel um, ID, the text box. Um, and we're adding, we've got lots of tracing in here, which is super useful. So if we come into our inspect element, we console, um, what this will do is it will give you a really great example of what the actual process looks like of actually creating one of these connections, which is really useful. So first of all, what we do is we've got um, created local peer connection. That says I've created my peer connection, um, and it's created a send channel. And so what we've done is this is essentially this is like a sin act, right? It's like I'm here, I'm here too. Um, awesome, let's talk. Essentially, is this first part. This here is what is one of those offers I was talking about. It's not human readable, which is a little unfortunate, and it's part of the spec I disagree with. Um, but essentially, we'll talk about this in a little more, what the bits in it represent. But as you can see, we've got like, we're established, because this is the same connection that would establish a, um, an audio or video link, right? So we're sending things like, uh, what audio codecs do I support? Um, there's a SHA-256 hash for doing the bidirectional encryption. Um, actually, that one's doing for signing, but um, in this context, it uses SDTP for, um, uh, it uses FTTP for text um, encryption from the libssl. Um, so essentially, we've got all of this data here, which we'll talk about in a little more detail. Um, so then we say, okay, I've sent my um, my local I've sent, and then they've gone, okay, they've sent back their remote peer connection, as we can see here, with exactly the same data because we're in the same window. Um, and then we've got our ICE candidates. And what ICE is, I'm going to cover a little bit later in that server thing that I talked about. But essentially, it's a way of establishing what the best way is to connect two clients to each other. Um, because it gets very difficult, unfortunately, which, as I said, is like the really annoying bit of WebRTC. But it's not, it's not WebRTC's fault. It's the fault of the internet infrastructure. Oh, no. I'm the wrong, I'm the wrong thing. Um, so yeah, this is, all, this is just a very quick thing. This is just, as I mentioned, it's peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. 
It's really awesome. You, add, you drag and drop a file, it gives you a link, and it uses WebRTC data channels to share a link to n number of other people. So you can share file data. And this is all open source as well, so you can take a look at it yourself. Um, this is the bit I was talking about. This is the ugly, dirty cousin of um, WebRTC. We say it's peer-to-peer, uh, -peer. Um, it's completely decentralized, it's this awesome new protocol, but there is an unfortunate situation where due to the infrastructure of the internet and the way that local networks work and subnets work on the internet, we have to use servers to do stuff, which is really unfortunate. We use servers for two different things. Um, the first of which um, is abstract signaling, right? What's very difficult to do is if I have a connection to say, okay, I'm available. How do I, who do, how, how do I know who to send that offer to, right? I, what, how do I know what public IP I should send it to for that represents another client? So that's very difficult. That's where a lot of these contexts you have signaling. So you have the idea of like, okay, I'm available. This is my ID. And you send it to the central repository, at which point somebody else can say, okay, I'm, um, I want to talk to a person with this ID. And then they get back one of those offer protocols. And then it essentially brokers the messages between them. Um, this one is like a, is actually a nicety, um, but you can implement it, and we're going to implement this in the data in a little while. But um, what you can see is you can use any mechanism for doing this. Ajax, we're going to use WebSockets, but you can use pretty much anything you like. Um, so essentially it's this, right? It's the idea that you've got your browser here, and the problem is that there's this media stream between the two. But if, you don't, if there's a line here, you don't know where they exist, you don't know what their public IP is, how do you actually start this? You could just sort of start, you start like iterating over every possible IP address on the internet so you find the right person. So what you have to have is this app that allows you to signal between the two to essentially allow you to do sort of bi-directional communication to say, okay, I'm available, these are my properties. I'm available, these are my properties. Let's talk. And because otherwise it becomes very difficult. But again, this is a fairly simple thing. But as I said, we, a little bit more about this session description. Um, we can see here this AASCM HMAR SHA. This is the encryption that happens for video. And there are actually a couple, of, I'm going to talk about security a little bit more in a minute, but security is very important because it uses various different types of encryptions and cipher suites in order to make this very secure. Ones that are specifically designed for, for instance, um, compressing and encrypting video streams, because you can imagine that would be a computationally very expensive thing to do. Um, but again, you can see here it's got all kinds of things like um, the Opus Audio Codec, um, MID Audio, which essentially means that um, I have an audio stream that I can share. Uh, and then we have bundle audio video, so that means I have audio and video I can share. So as I have audio and video, but then your uh, MID um, is audio. It's context. And you see IPv4, you see this? This is the bit that's important, right? At the moment it's 000 because I was doing this locally when I captured it. Um, but you can see that 000 is essentially saying, all right, here is my IP address that we can start a peer-to-peer -peer connection against. And again, you'd imagine that that's very simple, right? Um, but the problem is it's not always that simple, right? As you can imagine, there are situations where public IP addresses don't really work. They're not really something you can directly call into, which is where stun and turn come in. And long story short, this is the reason, is that NATs particularly, they're horrible, evil things that are out to get us. This is the ideal world, right? You've got your signal, and then you've got two peers, and between them they can exchange media. But unfortunately, that's not the real world. Um, if you're on a network that doesn't allow you to publicly access your a public IP, how do you do that media communication between the two? Like, if I, if I don't know what IP I am, how can I possibly send it to somebody else to say start a connection? Um, which is where STUN comes in. Session Traversal Utilities for NAT. And there's an acronym, if you remember, you'll get a gold star, because I had to look that up, and it took a long while to. Essentially, all it does is it says, what's my public IP? And Google have uh, publicly accessible servers that they let people do this against. It's what most WebRTC implementations use. It essentially just uses a, I believe it's TCP, that essentially says, okay, I'm a TCP packet, what was my origin? And then it, re it gives an ACK, uh, an ACK packet or several packets that say, this is your IP address. Um, so you can then say, okay, I know what my public IP address is now. I can add it into my offer so that I can then send it to somebody and say, okay, this is what my offer is. Let's start a connection. Um, again, it's super simple. We're, gonna, um, we're not going to write a stun server, but we could literally do it in like three lines in an express node app if we wanted. Well, if we didn't have to do TCP. Um, if we were doing it via over HTTP, we could do it very quickly. And then it still allows data to go peer-to-peer, -peer, right? It's just all you're getting is your public IP address, and after that, it's up to the browsers to talk to each other afterwards. But the problem, so this is sort of an input, this is the network diagram of it, right? We just have these stun servers that say, okay, what's my IP address? Let's get some media between them. 
Um, the other one is turn. This is where it gets a little more complicated. We're not going to go into this too much because it's really painful. But what you mentioned before about the flash uh, media servers, this is essentially what turn is. Um, essentially, it provides a fallback server to communicate between um, if you can't get a public address. Why would you not be able to? Because as I said, NATs suck. Because sometimes, as you probably imagine, if any of you guys work on VPNs and corporate networks, you'll know that the likelihood of your personal laptop being able to accept an anonymous TCP stream from somewhere on the internet and being allowed through the firewall, the chance of that's probably zero, right? There's no way your network admin is ever going to allow that. So what essentially turn does is it gives you the opportunity to say, all right, you know what, I'm going to actually just use these recognized servers that are going to stream my media between. So we lose all the benefit we get from peer-to-peer, um, -peer, but it still allows it to work under a lot of circumstances. Um, so ICE is this, interactive connectivity stuff. It's essentially this process of try stun, try a direct peer if a direct peer doesn't work, try stun if stun doesn't work, try turn, and it's that stack that you fall through um, in order to be able to establish these peered connections between each other. Um, and what's really great is that this is not a common problem, apparently. There's this WebRTC stat site that track from internals from Chrome, essentially how connections are started for WebRTC. And the great news is that there's lots of competent um, network admins out there who've allowed you to be able to traverse their external edge networks into a network internally only with a public IP address, which is awesome. Um, finally, I'll talk about security a little bit, and then we're going to get on to actually writing the code. Um, as I said, it's mandatory. So that means all data that goes back and forth um, um, is mandatory between these two um, endpoints, which is, again, fantastic, right? Because it means we don't have to worry about people snooping. Um, it's got the UI, which essentially means, as I mentioned, the click thing you have to allow or deny for a particular instance. And it's sandbox. This one's super important to me. is that Flash is horribly buggy and insecure. It's something we've known for a very long time. Um, if you can avoid using it, I mean, I turn off Flash entirely in every browser I have. And I only turn it on with very limited exceptions. But the great thing about this is that all of this stuff, because it's based in the browser, it can't break out in the same way Flash can. Like, Flash can execute outside of the browser context if you can exploit it. But this will never execute outside of the browser sandbox, which is awesome. So even if you somehow manage to find a way to um, either do some sort of buffer overflow attack on the WebRTC stream and get the internal browser to balk, it still has all of these nice process isolation um, sandboxed environments to work within, so it's much less of a security problem than doing video or peer-to-peer -peer via some other way. Um, so as I said, secure pathways, again, it's not necessary to do HTTPS for signaling, but it's best practice if you do, because um, obviously you're sharing private IP addresses, or public IP addresses, and that's not something you want to do in the clear. Um, but then, as you see, the, there's these two um, encryption suites, SR, SRTP, which is audio and video, which is a cipher suite specifically designed for compressing and encoding large quantities of high bandwidth data. Um, then there's DTLS, TLS from TLS, SSL, which is essentially a, uh, uh, a cipher suite from TLS, from libSSL, that essentially allows you to very quickly cipher, pardon me, binary blobs and strings. Um, so it's essentially a very similar thing to what you use for HTTPS. And both of these things are completely mandatory for doing these kind of communications. Um, there are arguments to be made that it should have a unified cipher suite, but I think that's it's pedantry at this point. Um, so then we're going to finally get to the meat of what we want to talk about, um, which is building an app. And in writing this talk, I came across this awesome thing. I never knew this existed before. Um, a friend of mine who works on the, um, uh, the Chrome Dev team, I was talking about this, asking him some questions, and he showed me um, essentially this. Uh, this Chrome internal thing. I'll show you how it works. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, so we have demos. Let's try... Uh, uh, which one are we going to do? Uh, okay, so... Get user media. In fact, no, let's not use get user media. Let's do peer connection. Start. Okay, let's just get this going again. Again, I'm just doing this so we can have some data that we can view. There we go. Call. And then we do Chrome. WebRTC internals. And it's this internal dump of all of your data that you get from doing WebRTC. And all of this is very useful in that you can get what the current state of all of these offers are and everything else. But what's also super useful is the number of graphs that you can get. So you can see things like um, uh, frame inputs, frame outputs, encodings. And there's all kinds of really useful data here for debugging issues 
with WebRTC. So if there's one thing that you take away from this workshop, let it be this, because it's awesome. Um, it makes it so makes it so much easier to build WebRTC apps. Um, and this is great as well. And that what you can see is you can see encoding, right? So you can see um, what's really nice is that some of the problems you have is that there's a lot of video encoding that happens um, when you're doing this kind of video traversal across streams. So you'd imagine that that's going to eat up a lot of processing time, which it does. So some of the nice things, if you have like your main UI thread that's rendering your JavaScript as an Angular app, for instance, you're doing lots of paints and doing video at the same time, you'll realize that your stack starts to slow down the way things go across it because your browser is doing these very intensive CPU operations for rendering video. So coming in here, I'd say, oh, actually, yeah, while it slows down, I can see that um, the average encoded um, megabytes per second has increased drastically. So I can see, OK, it's that. So maybe I should use a smaller video stream which will reduce the amount, the smaller resolution on my video stream or a lower frame rate so that I can actually use less encoding resources to free up my, free up my main UI thread, um, which is super, which has uh, been crazy useful for me over the last couple of days. Um, so essentially, as a, a lot, one of the points I've come to quite a lot is that there are lots of different browser APIs out there. They haven't really unified yet, which is unfortunate. So again, it's lots of boilerplate. So one of the re we, we talked about uh, a little while ago is there are lots of frameworks out there that make doing RTC incredibly simple. There's WebRT, Simple WebRTC, EasyRTC, WebRTC IO. All of them have very little overhead and provide much, much simpler APIs for implementing this stuff. So like, I would 100% say if you're going to build WebRTC into your app, use one of these. Don't do it yourself. There's very little point. The nice thing is that a lot of these guys keep up with the API changes because they are still changing. Well, the spec is finished, but the APIs are still being changed occasionally. So this is, I mentioned the simple WebRTC, that's all you need. Literally, you give it a local video, you don't even have to create video elements, you just give it like a DOM, give it a DOM object, like a div or something, and it inserts them all for you. And auto request media to say, ask me straight away whether you can use my video or not. Um, and we're going to build this actually into an Angular app in a moment, so we're going to see how it works. Um, and we, then we can all chat at the same time, because I've deployed it to Roku. Um, and it uses Google Stun service. Um, but then there's peer-to-peer -peer data, right? Because that does, that's just video and audio. It's not necessarily doing art data channels or anything else. So there's also PeerJS, which is awesome. Um, and again, PeerJS gives you a much lower level um, set, a lot lower, lower level set of tools for interacting with this stuff in that you can directly get video streams and audio streams. But it also allows you to do very easy uh, uh, connections for like opening and video calling and everything else. Um, so we're going to build an app now. Um, so, but we're about halfway through. So, do we want to take like a 10, 15 minute break? And then when we come back, we can start actually doing the app and actually get into the meat of it. Yeah? Sounds good, guys. Hope it's been interesting so far. Ha any questions? Please let me know. What are we going to do? Um, we're basically going to build a uh, multi party video chat client. So, essentially, we're going to have a web page that we're going to go to that's going to show our video. And it's going to create a channel or a room that n number of other people can join, and we can see their video as well. Um, to do it, we're going to use Angular for the front end with Simple Web RTC that we talked about. On the back end, we're going to use Socket IO uh, for doing the um, uh, signal signal the um, the signaling system that I talked about before. So what I'm going to do first is that it's broken down into you've got it in the code um, directory. Uh, of the of the GitHub repo and the thumb drive that was passed around, um, we can see that it's broken into a server and a, a client directory. Obviously, because they're completely separate. Um, so the the server directory is actually super super simple. It's literally a single file with like 40 lines of code in it um, that has a couple of different methods that are just like a couple of uh, messages that it has to support and deal with to maintain room state. And again, a lot of this. The actual only one that's necessary for a um, signal uh, passing uh, sig signal passing server for WebRTC is this first one is client on message that we'll talk about. But the other ones here, these join, disconnect, and leave are implemented so that we can do rooms because by default um, you don't actually support uh, like single to many um, connections in WebRTC. It's a multiplexed connection. So if we had a room, I'd need to set up a connection to you, 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 and you, and I have five simultaneous connections. Whereas with this, it just makes that a little simpler. You still have to set those up, but it just makes the creation of those rooms and the message passing a lot easier than it would be otherwise. 
Um, as I said, we're using Socket IO. We're actually using so an old version of Socket IO, which sucks a little bit, mainly because um, the sign ACK format that comes back from Socket IO has changed in one, and Simple Web RTC is based on a specific message format. I've actually got a pull request on Simple RTC at the moment to fix this to update it. But for now, um, we're going to use the one that you can just install with um, uh, with Bower install, npm install. So we don't you don't have to use a weird fork that only I've got. Um, so as you can see, it's a very simple app. We're not even mounting socket IO inside Express. Um, all we do is just mounting socket IO on a port, and from there we're um, just exposing it as just a, a, a primitive, just the I.O. primitive. And we're going to use the sockets plural feature for doing rooms to address multiple sockets simultaneously. Um, so again, we can just quickly walk through this and we can talk a little bit about what the things do and why they're there. Um, and then, as I said, at any point, if you guys have questions, put your hand up and I'm happy to answer them. Um, so first, the first line we'll hear is the I.O. Okay, sure. Socket IO is a library um, that is gives a very good baseline for implementing a web socket server in Node. Um, essentially, it was written because one of the problems with web sockets when it was first created, it's less of a problem now, but it's still an issue, in that it, web sockets, the web sockets protocol wasn't very well supported. And so what web sockets allows you to do is to gracefully degrade to other, uh, other protocols like um, the long polling or um, in some cases, you actually fall back right back to Flash as well, which seems to be a fallback for a lot of what I'm talking about today, which I think says a lot about the web. Um, but essentially, it's just a node module that allows you to create a message brokering service with WebSockets very easily with a sort of a syntax and a DSL that's quite similar to those that are used for building HTTP-based apps in Node, like uh, Express or something else. Um, so it's essentially just an event bus um, like an, um, a message broker that Matt sits on a server and brokers messages between the two different clients via the... Yes, indeed. This one's on Node.js. Yeah. Um, as I said, there are implementations like Socket.js in lots of different languages. Like Ruby has one. Well, Ruby has a weird one because Ruby... Anyway, but we won't talk about Ruby now. But um, Ruby has an implementation of Python implementations, Java, anything you can think of. This is and that will have a very similar model to this, this sort of event-driven model of when I get this message, do this. When I get that message, do that. But essentially, this one is node-based. Yes. Um, one of the nice things about it is that it, it allows me... I think the total number of lines of this, it's 100 lines with, like, lines between everything and full of comments. There's actually about 40 lines of code here. And about 40 lines you can write with Socket.io a very clear and condensed signal broker for WebRTC, which is super useful. Um, and all it essentially does is it just mounts on a particular port. Um, I've actually deployed this to Heroku, so if you open the, if you have it, if you have the code locally, if you do grunt serve in your client directory, and you join the room, it will use the remote version, so we can all actually be in the same room at the same time as well, if the bandwidth will hold up to allow us to do that. Because um, obviously it may just eat all the bandwidth, and they may start like shouting because they can't actually load Facebook or something. Um, so we think an IO, essentially IO set, so we're just setting a config level for socket IO. In this context, it's just log level. And the reason that we're doing that is so that when, we, when we're viewing it, we can see in a very sort of verbose way um, what is happening, what data we're sending back and forth. Um, it's essentially like console logging the um, express request object. Um, and it just makes it a lot, a lot easier to see, um, especially because we're doing some Synac stuff, which isn't immediately obvious what's happening when you're doing socket IO. This is actually based on, um, it's a much cleaned up version of the example server that Simple WebRTC use um, in order to demonstrate its functionality, but I changed a hell of a lot to make it better. Um, so as I said, what I'm going to quickly talk about is the things, the things that you need to do in order to be able to write one of these. Go ahead. This one here? I'm going to come back to that in a sec. I just want to quickly, quickly talk about these, and I'll come right back to it. Um, so we have this simple on message here, which, as I said, is just passing those offers between clients to say what, uh, what IP I'm at, what I support, that big offer unreadable chain of text that we saw before. But this thing, this client resources above, what this does is um, essentially this is here. Um, 
<laughs> as a way of, it's an API that Simple Web RTC expects to pass between clients. And what it essentially does is it's a shorthand for allowing it to more quickly generate streams to say, okay, um, we have screen, that's that share screen thing I talked about. We have video true, audio false, so it can straight away kick off a stream and say, put it into a video so you don't get like a couple of hundred milliseconds delay while it works out what the stream is from the offer itself. So again, this is just here for um, a default profile to just say like, this is what we're gonna have. So that as a messaging service internally, if I run the messaging server, I can say all the people that connect can only connect with video. They can't connect with audio. Uh, or the other way around. I can only connect with audio and not video. So it's essentially just a default profile for the users that connect to the room. Um, so essentially, as I said, there's this first one I want to talk about here, which is client on message. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, it's down and up as well. <laughs> Sorry, my little thing changed, the, um, changed it. So again, as I said, this is just a very simple, this is the only like the five lines of code that's actually necessary to write a signal broker for a WebRTC app. Um, as you can see, we have this hand message method. Uh, what it does is it, one of the problems you have is that um, the WebRTC protocol is very noisy in that it kind of falls back a lot of the time to just sending things across the wire. Just like, I don't know what it is, send it. I don't know what it is, send it. So some of the problems you have to deal with are having empty responses on these WebSockets connections. It's like, oh, I'm actually just gonna send some empty data to you. And there's a Chrome bug at the moment on Chrome um, that I've tweeted about that we're trying to get people to raise awareness of to stop Chrome doing this. But at the moment, it unfortunately does. So this, all this does is say that if the details, the, the details that I'm sending that offer is empty, return, don't do anything. Um, what we say is, so IO socket sockets details to. This is a, a construct that says the socket IO, all of our sockets that we have bound in socket IO um, are essentially saying, so of the socket array of all of our sockets, send it to this particular person, to this single socket to say, all right, I want to send a message from person A to person B. So this is just a way of manually selecting based on the two property of the detail of the, em of the message envelope, because this contains a to and a from, and then it contains a string, which is the offer. Um, I can show you guys in a minute when we look at the socket IO output. Um, essentially says, um, send this message to this person. Essentially, says, What this does is it just says if this person exists, effectively, so you don't send, try and send messages to people that have disconnected or something else. Not that they'll have too big an impact, but you want to minimize the stuff you send out to people over the wire, right? Um, and then what we do is we just select that. We select that socket. We say, okay, this person exists. Give me a socket for them. Um, and we do it, obviously, again, via the um, to string in the details envelope. Um, so what we say is we then add into our details envelope to say, like, okay, we're going to send you a message. So we've got our message, this details object up here. And what we've done is we're just adding another from property to it. So we can say, okay, it's, this is the ID, the socket ID, because this is the client. This client object here is the socket that is passed in from the socket IO connection. So this is a socket that represents a message stream that comes forwards and backwards from a particular client. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, so what we're saying is the ID of that client, send it as from. Essentially say, so, you, so we've now got a message envelope that contains the offer, it contains a to, and contains a from. So that you can then get a good idea of who and what is sending you messages back and forth. Um, and this is useful not so much for WebRTC, but for communicating to do with rooms that the implementation we're going to talk about in a little while, to actually have these sort of like single to many uh, rooms that you can join. And again, we just emit a message. We just emit the details object out to the client that we want to send a message to. So it's, it's, this is all you need, actually, for doing message brokering. So like, it could be six lines of code. And you can see why in the slide like from maybe an hour or so ago, it talked about how simple this is to do. Uh, it's literally a sync file. It, it took me five minutes to write this code and to deploy it to Heroku. And like, you can do it very simply um, uh, along the same lines. Um, so this one of the ways join. And like I said, these, these three here essentially are methods that aren't necessary for doing WebRTC. Um, the reason we're doing them is because we want to be able to do multi-party chat, sort of like Hangouts, where you can have me broadcasting to many people and getting many channels back. Um, but So what we do is we've implemented just a couple of um, uh, uh, handlers on these particular things. Two of them are the same as you can see this remove feed. So disconnect and leave, as you probably imagine, are Messages that say leave is fairly obvious. It says I'm no longer in this room. So it 
pushes a message out to all of the other people in the room to say you don't need to worry about this person's feed anymore, they're gone. Forget about them, they don't exist anymore. Disconnect is something that essentially disconnects you from, does, effectively does the same thing, but essentially what it does is it, on the client, the client emits a disconnect event where it also closes all of the connections. Because leaving the room essentially says, remove my socket IO socket um, from the pool, and so that any future messages broadcast to that room, I'm not sent them. Whereas disconnect, not only does that, but it also shuts down all of the peer-to-peer -peer connections you have, so your video will turn off too. So you can send this leave event to Socket.io um, and still maintain connections with people because this is a peer-to-peer -peer protocol, right? It doesn't matter that the server thinks you're gone if you still have an open connection between two people. Um, and so it's all sort of semantics, why we have two of them here, but it's just to illustrate the fact that this isn't actually necessary for brokering these connections between people. Um, so this first one is, again, this join is, again, very simple. Um, essentially says that if we don't pass a name um, of a channel we want to join, return. Um, and then we remove people, because a, a, a constraint of this demo is that you can only be in one room at a time. Um, obviously, if you open the new tab, you could be in a different room too, but if we had some sort of UI that would allow us to do like tabs in the UI, so you could be in multiple rooms at the same time, we could also do that. But here we just called that method we called above as the handler to just remove them from whatever rooms they're in. Um, what we then do is essentially say, for our open socket, it has a join method on it, and this join method is for using socket.io namespaces and socket.io rooms, as they're typically called, which is where it allows you to have a group representing a set of sockets. So you can say, instead of having five sockets and having to send to do what we did above, where we identified the socket we want to send a message to, this stuff here, having to iterate through all of your open sockets, see if they're in a room, and then send a message to each of them individually. What this allows you to do is to be able to address WebSocket subscribers via a single method. Um, so in this context, we said client room, and we do this here so that we add this property to the client object to the socket so that we can later address and see what room someone's in, effectively, so that when they leave it later on, we can then send a message say, okay, client.name, send to that room that they've just left, that they've left, and we don't care about them anymore. Um, and then we send ACK. So ACK is essentially, this is the thing I was talking about, this is the reason we can't use uh, Socket.io 1.7 or whatever it is at the moment, we're still on 0.9, is that this ACK parameter is different in one. Um, essentially what you've done, whenever you have these um, custom events that you subscribe to in uh, Socket.io, um, like uh, disconnect, leave, um, join, in that it passes a callback to you as the second argument, which is ACK, which is essentially an acknowledgement message that you send um, as soon as you uh, do something. As soon as you send a message, you straight away send something back based on a callback. In this context, what we're doing is we're sending a room description back, which is essentially saying, okay, I, I want to join a room, and so we're saying client join, so we've joined the room here, and then we're responding back to that client right away with who is in that room. So we say, oh, I want to join room foo, and then when I get back data that says these four people are actually in room foo, that means the simple web RTC on the client can then bootstrap the Angular UI to actually build the video for those clients. And actually, this is what I'll show you here. Um, we can see this is a very simple method as well. Right? All of these things are like five lines each. Um, so, and this is actually a bit, feels a bit, me feels really ugly and artificial because of the way that WebRTC expects this um, result hash to get back, but so be it, it's the clients, what they've implemented. Um, so we have this describe room, which essentially says io.sockets.clients. Then she says, get me all of the all of the sockets for all of the people in this particular web sockets room, in this particular um, a socket pool. And then we build up this hash and this method I like, and we just iterate over them and just pass in this default hash from above, this client resources. Um, to be an object to represent all of them. Um, and this is here where you could do some funky stuff, like you could say, um, uh, if client supports HD, pass in an HD video hash. If client supports this, pass in that. So there is logic behind why they want this, but like, I don't know, it feels a bit unnecessary, especially when you can specify all that stuff in the client. And we just return that here, and we just send it back in the act. Uh, with null as the message. And again, that's what's changed. This null parameter here is no longer defined, and it's actually one of the weirdest bits of code I've seen is where it checks for the presence of null in code. So it says, if something is not null, then it's, I don't know, it's, just, it's a weird control flow in the code they've got. It essentially means it breaks when you do, um, when you uh, upgrade to the new socket. 
Um, but actually, that's the second one. That, that, those two methods here are what you need to actually join these rooms, to actually have multiple... Sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, as you can see, this join up here, this join's called here. Um, and those are just the two arguments that are passed from socket IO. So it's essentially the name um, of the, it's essentially the payload of the message that they've sent, which is the name of the room they want to join. And then the second argument is just a callback. I've called it ACK because it's an acknowledgement, but that could literally just be called callback. So it's just the two arguments that are passed to the callback from the message, essentially. Um, so yeah, yeah they give, on all custom events in Socket IO, you get that second callback, so you can do acts if you want to. Um, so yeah, I mean, th those are the two methods. So we've got rooms now, right? I mean, you can join a room, everyone can be in a room, we can broadcast events to everyone in the room. Um, so then the, f the other one here that we've talked about is this remove feed that I talked about, which is essentially just remove one person from a room. Um, so what we have here is we do if client room, so we say if they're actually in a room, um, so that if they're disconnected clients, and this is just this is an issue because I found that, and I raised this on the project as well, in that this is a bug in that there's certain times at which Simple Web RTC doesn't pass um, so, uh, the sort of the room message that you want to join. But again, that's um, again that's another bug, and it's just it's very easy to take care of because you just do this, and it doesn't get a connection. It just tries again and sends the room a second time, so it's fine. Um, so actually, what we do is then say um, for all of the sockets in the room emit remove and give it a client ID. So it's very simple. It just says emit a message to everyone in this room that this client has gone and it's no longer there and you don't really care about them. So then they can then simple web RTC can just tear down the video, tear down all the streams to not actually care about it anymore. Um, and that's it. I mean that's literally all we need. Like these like four methods, no three methods in fact, or four including the um, describe room to actually build this signaling server. Um, I've done a very bad thing and I haven't written any tests for this. Um, but if there were tests, like, I'd have like 10 of them, probably 12 of them. It's just checking whether you've bound sockets or not. It's a very simple thing to test as well. What we've also done here is when the client actually connects the first time, we emit this object here. And this is a standard object that um, uh, WebRTC expects uh, when you do connections to signals. Essentially, it says it gives you back an array of stun servers, which is what we talked about, which is where you can get your public IP. Um, that's very important. And what you also do is that um, it would also look for, should it need to, at the moment we haven't implemented them, you'd also emit a turn servers object, which would give you the addresses of the turn servers that you'd use if you couldn't use stun, um, so that ice could fall through them. So I could say, if I can't do a direct peer connection, do stun and then do turn. I haven't added it here because I actually couldn't find any turn servers that would allow me open access to them, as you'd imagine, because they eat a massive amount of bandwidth and resources to run turn servers. So you have to pay for most of them. That's pretty much it. I mean, literally, you can see our package JSON is about as simple as it gets, right? We have socket IO, like absolutely nothing else. Um, as I said, I've deployed this to Heroku, so you can actually go and see. Um, I think it's uh, JS channel, uh, JS channel. I can't remember what is it called? So? Yeah, it's um, uh, yeah, J um, JS channel WebSocket signal, but. Heroku app, but it's in the code, it's in the um, Angular app that we're going to talk about in a moment. So again, that's pretty much it. I mean, you can obviously do a lot more sophisticated things when you're running a server like that. Um, this is the basis of what you could also do for a channel server for games, right? We like the example we were talking about earlier, is that this concept of a room doesn't necessarily have to be a persistent one, right? It could be a game instance. So if you have a multiplayer game, you can set up one of these rooms for each instance of that game. And so you could have... Um, Essentially, you can use WebSockets to essentially establish the connections for a game. So you could say, all right, there are five people playing this instance of a game that they want to share, and therefore we have them registered all into this room instance, so that should we need to, we can send messages out to them en masse for this game and get data back so we can synchronize them across. And doing WebSockets is very low latency anyway, but the nice thing is, is once you've done that, they handle all of the connections themselves with peer connection from WebRTC. So you, you no longer have to care about any of this. And one of the nice things is that in order to do that, you can actually write a client that I'm actually halfway through writing, which is a node-based client for registering yourself as a peer connection. Essentially, it uses a way of, um, it uses PhantomJS 
to register a peer connection, and essentially it streams out from Phantom. So that theoretically, if you're doing that game, you could like register yourself as one of the clients, and they'd be passing data to you at the same time as they pass to each other. So you could do like a cheat broker to make sure no one's cheating. You could do um, like a high score saving or something, or whatever you like. Um, and that's very simple to run. I mean, you could eat, then you just have it subscribe like a regular client in here. Um, so again, what we're going to talk about next is we're going to talk about the client app. The client app has a lot more boilerplate in it, as you can imagine. This is just a standard um, uh, uh, Angular generator from Yeoman. Um, so there's a lot of stuff in here that will never be used. But essentially, we have two or three files that we care about. Um, and I'm actually going to talk a little bit. A lot of the code we're going to write in here is actually much more Angular code than it is WebRTC code. Um, but I'm also going to do some like things that aren't very idiomatic when it comes to Angular. Um, the other, the other uh, workshop in the other room was about Angular directives, right? And Angular directives are awesome. But like, one of the problems is that WebRTC is not built with Angular's way of interacting with the DOM in mind. It's very sort of jQuery-y in the sense that it expects you to pass a DOM ID um, to start and a, for a local and a remote connection so that it can bootstrap them itself inside the template. Um, I did convert it into a directive, but I ended up pulling out so much of the WebRTC, simple WebRTC code into an Angular template, it was no longer simple RTC, it was like an Angular implementation of WebSockets, and there were loads of those already. But I just wanted to show you how simple it is to do, so I've sort of left it in a way that's a little bit hacky and nasty, but um, I'll show you in a moment so you can get an idea of what we're doing. Um, so essentially the apps, again, very, very simple indeed. We just have our regular script directory. We have one root. Again, it's, this is just the boilerplate. I have left it. I've written as little code as I possibly can. Um, we literally just have a single view, a single controller, a single view um, that just that loads. And I'll show you our main view. I mean, this is essentially, I'll show you the app in a moment, actually. Which might actually but let me show you that now. It might probably be a little e easier to... Um, There we go. That's it. That's the beginning of the app. Um, it's all bootstrap based, as you'd imagine. So we've got a room that we can join up in the top left, which is our JS channel conf room. Um, we've got a join button, a disconnect button. That disconnect does a thing where it drops all the connections and leaves rooms, which we talked about on the server. The join button, obviously, is the implementation of the join method we added on the server. And again, I can add anything in here, so I can join arbitrary rooms if I like. Um, there I am. I'm in the room. Oh, damn it. My CSS is awful. Um, essentially there. So this is if you're running this locally, you can join this room now. We can see each other. Uh, like you can appear on screen. Um, if you just run this app locally, it will you, it will bind to the same Heroku instance that I'm using, and it will distribute it that way. So we can actually go peer to peer that way. Um, so if you want, you can. Be, oh, there we go. There's someone. <laughs> um, so and any num again. I think it's a bit slow because the Wi-Fi is very slow. So like you can imagine that any number of people can join, and it can show it across here. Um, so it's a very simple. It's a very simple method. Hello. Um, it's a very simple way of building these very powerful interfaces, right? In that, with what's probably 100 lines of code total, I've written something that is effectively a multi party chat, pretty much, um, for video chat for pretty much anyone. So, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to talk about the way it's implemented a little bit um, in Angular, particularly. And again, this is a very simple Angular app, so please don't expect anything too sophisticated. Um, essentially, what we've got is we've got one service and one controller. Um, that simple WebRTC service is, as you'd imagine, um, A, it's not idiomatic in Angular to use global objects. You want to use, like, if you have to use it, you do dollar window dot something or um, anything else, or you expose them through a service in this context. So again, what we would do if we were writing idiomatic Angular is we just do uh, pass window in, and then we just do window dot simple webrtc because simple webrtc is just the window object that is exposed through the JavaScript library. Um, in this context, I've just been lazy and not done it, um, but it works exactly the same way. Um, and all this essentially does is it exposes, it wraps our implementation method within a service, which is generally best practices in Angular as well, is to abstract as much as you possibly can into these um, service singletons. Obviously, what you don't want to do necessarily is um, add in something that is quite monolithic in terms of memory and in terms of CPU usage into a controller because a controller is essentially a class in the sense that JavaScript has any classes and that there are instances of it and new instances are created and destroyed as you navigate between pages and so therefore you can have situations where if I was 
if I had if I built another app that had multiple controllers, if I was going between them, you'd be creating new instances of Simple Web RTC every time. Whereas, obviously, if it's in a service, a service is a singleton that exists across controllers. It's a way of sharing state as much as anything else. Um, essentially, what we do is we pass it this um, URL, which is essentially just our WebSocket server that we had before, deployed on Heroku. And then, as I said, this is the hackiness that we've done. You can't even spec whether it's a class or an ID, which I don't like either. But essentially, what this is, is I'll show you in the HTML in a second. They're just divs with IDs, and it will render the video in there for you. And then we have Auto Quest Media True, and we have this event that we subscribe to, which is a custom WebRTC event, a custom simple WebRTC event, which is ready to call. Essentially, it says it's done that brokering, so it's done a, it says I'm available on the network, it's gone to the signal messenger, and says I've joined. Um, I'm ready, I'm available, I can accept connections, it's bootstrapped the WebRTC peer, con the peer connection for WebRTC. Oh, wow, I can suddenly see again. Um, so what we've then got is, um, in this context, we've just got a couple methods that essentially have done the thing of um, just exposing methods on our, um, on our sort of class instance into our controller that have just exposed them as public methods. So we've got like init, join room, leave room, disconnect and volume. Um, volume I've implemented here, but I forgot to turn volume true on the server implementation on, so that um, I could do that very quickly and I could redeploy it and we can see it working. Um, but I also did it so that everyone's laptops wouldn't get really loud during the demo when everyone's talking. Um, but essentially, it's very simple, right? It's literally just bootstrapping simple web RTC, um, saving an instance to it um, in our scope, in our, well, on our um, service scope, and then returning that. Um, and returning various methods to it. And you actually return an instance of it into the controller so that you can then, in our controller, we can do things like simple WebRTC service in it. And if I was doing this properly, I'd use promises, but it's just a simple callback to keep it simple. We then pass RTC out onto it so we can then bind other events to, so, that our, um, so that our particular, so that our, all of our UI side effects from the effects that are exposed from simple WebRTC um, can be bound. And I, I like this method because what it essentially does is that it means that what we're doing is all the events we only care about in the UI, which are these events, which are joined room, left room, aren't in our service anymore. It is that our service only cares about network interfaces and creating the actual objects themselves. It sh your service never care about your UI, right? It shouldn't have, shouldn't have to know any implementation details. It should just be a standard API you can implement. And so what this does is it delegates the um, the binding of our events that are important for our UI to our controller, which is the medium between our model and our view, right? It's very simple stuff. I'm probably not telling you anything you don't know. But essentially, what we have here is our, um, essentially, we're just setting methods on the scope. We're getting, setting things on the scope that allow us to um, essentially just build our UI around RoboTC. So what is, actually, a lot of these are related to the view. So I'm going to go into the view to quickly talk you through it. Uh, that's all done internally in simple uh, WebRTC. Essentially, when it does that connect, that first connect that you do with ready to call, what it's done is it's gone to the signaling server and said, okay, I'm ready, I've connected. And then as we saw in the server before, um, right away the server emits the stun servers. Um, so it says, okay, I've joined. And before that ready to call exists, it's already done the ICE connection. So it's already done what is the best way that people can connect to me. <laughs> For a message. So this library is listening for the stun server's message. Yes, absolutely. And right. most of them do. You should never actually have, if you're using one of these libraries, you'll never actually implement the ICE protocol yourself because it's a very complicated thing to implement. So a lot of it is hidden behind um, the libraries themselves. All right, thanks. So in this context, I think there's just a callback internally in Simple with RTC that says um, if peer connection wasn't successful first time, try a stun server, get their public IP, yada, yada, yada. Um, so you shouldn't have to worry about it, at least theoretically. But if you actually want to know how it's done, in the um, demo that I showed earlier, where you've got two videos on the same page, that has a nice implementation on it. Oh, we lost video. I saw, I saw that there was a null passed in for servers. Yeah. yeah, the servers array in this context, um, um, servers is essentially just a, a, allowing you to override it at runtime so that you can say, all right, I don't want to listen to the thing that's come back on the socket. I want to give it my new server. You know, I'm going to give it a manual set of servers. Um, then it's just a hash that you pass in anyway, and it just it does the same thing, effectively. Um, we seem to have lost video a little bit. So, um, uh, Well, essentially, 
So what I'll do here is I'll sort of circle back around to talk a little bit about more about that until we actually get the video back so you can start looking at code. Um, is that um, the ICE protocol is something that is exposed through a set of primitives um, in the peer connection API. Like you can do, there's on ICE candidate, which essentially is a callback that you get when an ICE candidate is successful or not successful and what, the, what failure conditions there were at what stage in the ICE protocol and the ICE fall through it. it um, it starts to work. Um, so that's something you can iterate on, right? So you can say if um, if on ice candidate, so that if the fallback on ice candidate equals turn, then you can say, all right, if we're doing via turn and I own that turn server, I want to make sure it uses as little bandwidth as it possibly can. So on turn server, I'll make my video much smaller, so I have to pay less in network charges. Or you can say if it's direct peer to peer, go full HD because then it's only a matter of the individual's bandwidth. So it essentially allows you to much more intelligently build your UI or your video based on that, but it's not something you have to do. And what a lot of people do is they delegate all of that stuff to actually working on the constraints object that you pass in when you do get Media API anyway. So you can just say, all right, I care about this format or this format or this format, and you just let the browser decide based on that bandwidth management that Peer Connection does I talked about, about what it thinks is most suitable. Suitable Because it can, it can downgrade things automatically for you if you like as well. So it will only send really poor choppy video um, if you have a low bandwidth connection or very good crisp HD video if you have a very good connection. Um, ah, there we go. Perfect. Perfect timing, just as I finished. Um, Yep, so it's going to take a couple of seconds to warm up, I think. Um, but actually, what we have here is um, just a very simple Angular view. Actually, hold on, let me make sure I'm, I am word wrapping. Um, essentially, it is about as simple as Angular view as you can possibly get, which essentially just is, in about 48 lines, the entire UI you need in order to implement. And actually, a lot of this is actually just bootstrap UI. That there's a lot of form group lines and input group lines, so you can probably remove half of it and it would still work. Um, essentially, what we have, what we care about, first of all, is this input, right? Um, which is our ng model of room, which is the thing that in our UI um, um, is essentially, um, oh, there we go, is this. And I can do anything. So I can do foobar room join, and then I'm in a foobar room, and somebody else can type foobar in there and join as well. Um, it's essentially just setting a model, and this is really annoying me. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> I did this presentation at a much wider, pre uh, much wider screen resolution where that wasn't a problem. Shows why I should test my code more. Um, and then what? So that's the model that we bind from. So as we can see in our um, implementation here, when we do, oh, no, that's not the right one. It's controls main. Um, when we have our join room, we literally say simple. Uh, um, simple WebRTC room, join room, and we pass it a room because we can optionally pass this function an argument to say join this room specifically, or we can grab it from the scope. So you can do whatever someone's entered in that box, click join, and you join that room. And Web simple WebRTC will bootstrap the connections for you to join that room. And this is what I mean by so simple. Um, and then we just um, flip a couple of um, uh, scope methods to change the UI to say, I'm now going to show you the UI that you can see when you're in the room as opposed to when you're um, logged out before. Um, so essentially, that's pretty much the join recess, that join room functionality, um, uh, which is based on this particular button. On what, let me just redo this so you can see it more specifically. Um, which is this. Obviously, disconnect is uh, this one here that just exposes the disconnect method, which in this context just does is just a uh, class method or a class method on the simple WebRTC object. So it's literally just sending a message that says, I'm done, I don't want to be in any rooms anymore. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, after that, it's again, it's, I could go through this line by line, but again, a lot of it's so simple that you, probably, you could probably read it and not need me to tell you what's going on, right? That's the great beauty of WebRTC, is that doing things that are actually quite complex technical subjects, like doing video, doing audio, even if you don't use a library like this, so like 40 lines of code or 50 lines of code, uh, which is really fantastic. Um, so we have leave room, obviously, which is the the one of the two uh, WebSocket messages that we're subscribing to, to say I actually want to leave the room, but I want to maintain my connections. Um, so that's what this will do as well, is that we have this WebRTC leave room. Essentially what it does is it says that I want to disconnect from the particular room I'm in on the signaling server, but I don't want to remove any of the uh, peer connections that I've set up with the people who are in that room. So I can actually say, all right, I don't want anyone to know I'm in the room, 
so the server has things I've left, but I can still keep chatting to people, um, which is actually a great thing for privacy as well. Um, cause it means you can just disappear from any sort of server logs um, when you're actually still talking to people. Um, and this is a cool one as well, which is set volume for all. Internally in, web, in Simple Web RTC, it uses the Web Audio API in the same way that I showed you in that demo in the beginning. And the um, Web Audio API, the way it works, um, is that it exposes a single channel of audio in the, or a single global channel of audio that pipes through the Web Audio context. But what you can do is you can split that channel into the multiple people, so you can actually say, all right, I want to turn person A, I want to turn like Timmy down, or turn Amit up. I want to like, and but at the moment what we've got here um, is just a set volume for all, and they expose methods for set volume where you can pass it an ID and then a float between zero and one, and it will set the volume for that particular client. So if I join JS channel here, um, I can expose this, and I, oh, I get my UI is a bit broken. Um, I can adjust the participant volume. So all of the volume of everybody that I'm listening to is adjusted up or down based on the selections in that um, uh, HTML5 range input. Um, so as you said, this is a, it's a very simple Angular app, right? I mean, I could do this, I did pretty much exactly this without Angular from one of the demos, and it was like 40 lines of code. But what it, what's nice about this is that Angular gives us all of the nice UI constructs for building things like doing two-way DOM binding for showing this message here when I'm in the room, for essentially allowing me to do this instead of having all kinds of granular on binds and stuff like you'd have to do if you're writing raw JavaScript. Um, so essentially, it just gives us some niceties for building this UI. But one of the great things about it is that the, the actual simplest bit of this is the WebRTC. The simplest bit of it is actually creating the audio and video connections. The rest of it is just me messing around with Angular when I really didn't need to. Um, so if there's any other questions about this particularly, um, we're pretty much, I have a one or two more slides that I want to get through, but like, that's pretty much it for this. I mean, there's not a massive amount more here. I mean, we could talk a little bit more about sort of design choices for the Angular app and that kind of stuff, but it's not really WebRTC focused, it's um, Angular focused, but we can talk about that if you have any questions or comments or suggestions or insults or anything else. Um, I'm happy to stand up here and take them. Um, is there any people hands up? Um, I, I, were you planning to use Kraken.js uh, Kraken um, on the Express? Sorry, say that again? Like, um, in this session, the yep. description, you were planning to use Kraken, right? So uh, I was, yes. I started out doing Kraken, and I realized, why am I doing Kraken? It's like, I don't need Express at all to do this. So I just used WebSockets. Um, but there is a version of, there's a fork of the GitHub repo, um, which has a Kraken version of this. But all it is, is it's literally starting an Express app, mounting WebSocket, web, mounting Socket.io inside it, and then not actually using Express for anything else. So it, was, it felt a bit pointless in the end. Yeah. So is there any uh, example of application, anything like uh, which is connecting Socket, uh, it's storing all the data in the DB, MongoDB or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. It'd be super simple to do. I mean, um, one of the nice things, well, I mean, it'd be very easy to do, but the question is the value you get from it, right? Because one of these great things about this is that as a central broker, a message broker, as that message service, you can never know the um, quality or the existence of any connections between people, right? So I could save to a database that these five people are in this room, but I have absolutely no way of knowing whether they're actually in that room or not because they're brokering the connections between each other. So like, all five of them could disconnect and their web sockets would close, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're not in the room anymore, right? Because they have peer connections. So it's very easy to do. And in the context of the, um, of the node stuff, um, when you do join room, um, room join, you could literally add it to a database there. You could just add like a callback to Mongo or to Redis to persist the state of the room. It'd be very simple. Um, any other questions? Sure. So is there any limit to the number of peers that each client can connect to? It's a very good question. It was asked by someone else just a few minutes ago. Um, uh, in theory, no. In practice, yes. Um, in theory, that there is no hard limit that the browser can support. Um, in practice, it's based on resources and the browser implementation. Um, realistically, when you start getting up above about 10 or 15, you start to hit real, like, real slowness in most browsers. Because um, essentially when when you implement a stream, like an audio video stream to a client, what you're, not, what you're doing is effectively creating about 10 or 12 long-lived objects in the stack 
um, that you're listening to that are streaming lots of data. And classically, the, the garbage collectors of things like Chrome don't like long-lived objects, right? They try and reap them as fast as they can. So classically, the idea is that before, it used to be only possible to have one RTC peer connection because it would just the garbage collector would just go nuts and it would just, I don't know what to do. Um, and is this client still alive? Is it not? But at the moment, um, th there have been changes to the way that the garbage collector works with these particular kinds of objects. Um, so it works much better. But there is still a realistic limit. And it obviously depends on the hardware. Like on an i7 MacBook, I can do 15 without. Well, I mean, the laptop tries to burn a hole through the desk, but I can still do it, right? But if you do it on a low power netbook or something, you're probably not going to be able to support that many. But theoretically, as many as you like. Um, there is actually a service called, I think it's Broadcast IO, that uses WebRTC to do single to many like web, uh, webcasts. So you can actually connect with hundreds of people at once, but they do very clever things with like uh, munging connections and they manage the connection state. So they can do things like they combine video streams, they can combine four client videos into a single client video and like break clever stuff to avoid that exact problem. But yeah, no limits theoretically. Uh, one other question. So right now you're just streaming it in, into a video tag, right? So right. right now the video stream, you're just putting it onto a video yeah. element. Absolutely. So it would also be possible to render multiple streams onto Canvas and do a absolutely. sort of... Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I'm sure. Um, one of the actual things that we're doing is um, in one of the demos that we have where we do the audio sequencer, um, that exact method for outputting the audio stream to a Canvas could be used for outputting video to a Canvas. Um, so it's very, very possible. And there are arguments to say that it's actually... Um, if you have multiple videos, like you said, it's actually a lot more performant in terms of UI because if you're having to maintain um, blob state to multiple DOM objects, if you have multiple video tags, as if you've got one giant canvas, you don't have to touch the DOM at all, um, so it becomes a lot more performant. Um, but yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, it's a, it's a great way of uh, optimizing it. Sure. Uh, so the stun servers that you are using in the yep. demo, right? Those were Google public servers, right? Yep, they are so indeed. if I wanted to use my own hosted server as a stun server, what do I need to do? Uh, I think, hold on, stun D, I think it's good. There are lots of implementations of them. And it, literally all stun is, is just, it's a specific uh, TCP IP protocol that just responds to a request packet with a response that contains the IP, the public IP address. So you could probably implement it in 10 lines, um, and all you have to do is just literally there are, I think stun D is a, Python service, I believe. There's a Go one as well, and there's Node ones too. So you can run your own ones super simply. And it takes, it's like, it's very low overhead. I mean, a friend of mine runs a Stun server because he writes uh, a Ruby implementation of Stun, and he runs it on a micro free instance on EC2, and it can do hundreds of requests a second, no problem. So it's almost trivial to implement. Um, Thanks, you. And Turn, on the other hand, is a whole different thing. Turn, you have to do video proxying and everything else. Um, when Google were giving the one YouTube video on this, um, like on the introduction, some kind of so, uh, in the video there there will be a side small window in that the uh, other users' video will be open. Our own video will be open in that. Yeah. Even if you change the tab, the window. That small view, uh, window will be open. Keep on opening. Is there anything like that we can do? Or oh yeah, um, there's. Um, it depends on the browser, but browsers treat um, unfocused the, like the, unf the, not the. I can't remember what the API is called, but the API allows you to programmatically detect if a window window is visible. It's one of the um, new API. I can't remember what it's called, but like essentially, some browsers implement that with WebRTC, so that if I turn to another. Um, tab, therefore my video goes black. Sometimes it doesn't. I'm not telling you which browsers do which because it's a bit controversial because the idea is that I can show you, a great example is I can show you this, right? If I'm in this room here and I'm also in this room, I'm a, sep I'm a new client, right? It's not the same client at all. So like, do you turn off that? I can be in multiple WebRTC rooms in different tabs. So what do you do? Do you turn it off so I can't be seen when I don't know I'm being seen? Or do you allow people to be in multiple rooms? Um, I think my Oh, there you go. Um, um, yeah, there we go. Oh, I joined a different room. But um, essentially, yeah. So essentially, so you can have multiple streams open in multiple tabs. 
Um, so yeah, some do, some don't. I, I believe it's going to be a setting for um, constraints in the near future, so that you can do constraints tab visible and tab unvisible, so you can turn video on and off, and it's programmatically declarable, but at the moment you have to do all kinds of hacky stuff, like you have to use the tab visible API that you just like unmount the stream from the WebRTC connection, so you just effectively handle that state yourself. Oh, awesome. Any other questions? Uh, oh, one more question. Sure. Here, no problem. Uh, so, so screen capture, again the screen capture. Um, so when we are doing, where there will be a um, slight message will be shown. Right? Like, so go ahead. Yeah, there will be a, a slight message showing like you are sharing your screen like that. Uh, yes, it will, in the same way they ask for permission to share audio and video. Yeah, and uh, when you are sharing the screen, there will be always that message will be there, right? Like you are um, the screen. I'm not, I don't think it will, not in the... Uh, in the desktop itself, even if you are showing the desktop, uh, that... Uh, yes, yes, indeed. Um, it's something you can declare programmatically yeah. in the same way with the notification API. Um, but a lot of the time, browser vendors, Chrome particularly, if you so if you're sharing your whole screen and you minimize the browser, it will still show you something to say that you're still sharing your screen. Yeah. Um, but that's a security and privacy thing that those guys do. But there's no real reason you have to do that. They just thought it was a better way to build the API. Yeah, I just want to know if you can customize or like. I don't know. I'm not entirely sure. I'll find out. But I'm not. I don't think you can because it's going to be like the same way that you can't customize the nag bar for can we use audio and video so you can't trick people into showing you audio and video when they don't know. Um, so I doubt you can, but it may be worth checking out. 